Thank you all for coming. I hope you had a good coffee break. Um, and I hope you're all charged up with the caffeine in your system to have a good discussion in this session. My name is Shipra Narunsuri. I am uh, the outgoing Vice President of Technical Cooperation and Projects of ISOCARB. And I'm in my day job, the coordinator for the Open Planning and Design Branch at UN Habitat in Nairobi. And it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody in this session. We're going to talk about, predominantly about this, which is the International Guidelines uh, on Urban and Territorial Planning, which have been formulated by um, UN Habitat, but not only this. We want to get a range of views on other, other um, um, instruments, other guidelines, other frameworks on urban planning and see how they, how they mesh together. Um, you've all heard the stories about cities. I mean, we, we are here in this room and we're here in this conference because we do understand the stories about cities and about urbanization and about how uh, the world is hyper-urbanizing and how it's, you know, particularly the developing world, etc. what the numbers are. So I'm not going to rehash those. But, um, Um, but just to say that there are two or three facts, I mean, coming to, come to what we're going to talk about in this session, there are two or three things that I'd like to draw your attention to. I think the first one is something that not, um, you know, there's so much focus on large cities and metropolitan areas and, you know, the vulnerability of large coastal cities, etc., that we forget that actually it is uh, the small and medium towns which are facing the maximum growth in developing countries. About 60% of um, urbanization is actually happening in small and intermediate sized cities. And these are the cities which have no capacities to manage this growth. And planning capacities is just one of those capacities that they don't have, but they also have governance challenges, they have technology challenges, try offering you know, smart city solutions to a small municipality in Togo and they'll be like, what? Are you talking about them? Just so I think it's important to understand that that's where the growth is happening. That's where the capacity challenges are. I think a second challenge that we're facing, which I'd like to highlight, so there's plenty, but I'd like to highlight, is that urban and rural areas are kind of being managed and growing in very divergent ways. It's also in our minds. If you're if you talk about rural areas, you're seen as anti-urban. If you talk about only urban, you know you're seen as somehow undermining agricultural areas, rural areas, or broader regions, development regions. There was a big debate about this when we talk when we when we were formulating the new urban agenda as to why it should be called the new urban agenda at all. You know there should be something more regional, something more. How do you bring in the urban rural linkages, etc. So urban and rural, and how do you bring that whole uh, spectrum of issues together because obviously they are symbiotic, obviously they are related to each other, the, the challenges are intertwined. How do you bring all that together is a second point and, and I'm going somewhere with this so bear with me. <laughs> I think the third challenge that I'd like to talk about is also the fact that um, there is a divergence at different levels of policy. National policy, economic policy, urban policy, where it exists, regional policy, often does not speak to metropolitan policy, to you know, urban um, development plans and policies at the local level, and down, absolutely down to the neighborhood levels. There is no vertical integration. Forget about integration, there is no really vertical conversation in many countries between these different levels of, uh, levels of policies and plans and, and approaches. So I think that's something else that we are facing, which is, which is a big, big, big challenge. And of course, these are the ones that you know already. The challenges of housing, the challenges of poverty, the challenges of inequality, inequity, the challenges of you know, poor access to services, infrastructure, so we don't need to rehash those. But still, we have set a set of lofty goals for ourselves. You've been hearing since the morning, but also since those of you who were here since the weekend, you've also been hearing about the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, we talked about how it's not just about SDG 11, which is the urban goal, which is relevant to us. I think there's much more than that. Many of the sustainable, 17 sustainable development goals, almost you know 50% or 60% of the targets under the 17 SDGs have urban implications. And the SDGs 
as a whole will not be realized until we start looking at urban areas in a much more holistic fashion. We start addressing them in a much more holistic fashion. This is where we want to go. But you know, planning was not the preferred route to get there for a long time. In fact, towards the end of the last century, planning fell distinctly out of favor. It's only the last 10 or 15 years that it's recaptured re, uh, that position of being a preferred instrument and being a preferred um, tool for a variety of reasons. It was seen as an obstacle to development. It was seen as, you know, um, it was seen as being outdated. It was seen as taking too long. And therefore, you know, well, it was just not a preferred instrument to achieve any kind of de development goals. And even within UN Habitat, which I represent here today, I can confess that until 2005 or 2006, really, we had no room for planning. We were not talking about planning at all. We were talking about housing. We were talking about slum upgrading. We were talking about basic services. We were talking about urban management and governance, but we did not see planning as an essential element of those, of, of those themes. It's only since 2006 World Urban Forum in Vancouver, between then and 2016, the Habitat Three Conference of Planning really came center stage. And as part of that uh, coming center stage, we are now at a moment where we have the new urban agenda, which has what, as Rick said in the morning, 70 plus substantive references to plans and planning. One third of the section on effective implementation, and a big one third, not, not numerically one third, but much larger numerically, is on planning. The other parts are on finance and governance, but really planning takes the center of it. So we are, we are back in business. But this is the vision. And how do we get there? And one of the tools to get there is this. The International Guidelines on Urban Territorial Planning, which were formulated with um, ISOCARP support. And ISOCARP is, in fact, one of the drivers of these guidelines. Um, the idea is that when you have a small town and a planning practitioner, a solitary, lonely planning practitioner sitting in a small city or a small town, and he says, you know, okay, these are, this is great, SDGs, New Urban Agenda, Sendai Framework, Humanitarian Summit, whatever, whatever. Okay, so all these intimidating international agendas, what am I going to do with them? How do I translate them into my reality? Give me a simple set of guidelines to follow. And this is where the simple set of guidelines comes into the picture. This is going to, as I said, form the basis of our discussion, but not the, not the, whole, not the whole or the frame of our discussion, but not the be all and end all of this discussion. We have a panel here today that will be talking about the guidelines, but also talking about other frameworks, other approaches that advocate for similar values and principles. And we'd like to see where the synergies are and where the, you know, where the matchups are. And we'd also like to explore maybe some um, initiatives or projects really from the bottom up, from the ground, to see how these guidelines can actually be uh, translated. So with that, and without further taking up any more time, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the panel we have here um, today. Andrea Oyuera, my colleague, uh, she is the task manager for the international guidelines in UN Habitat. She's an architect and urban planner from Honduras, um, and has studied and lived in the Netherlands, and is now based in Nairobi, in Kenya, for the past um, year or so. On the far right, Nice how the women sort of frame this discussion. Um, Helena Olsen, urban specialist, also a spatial development expert at SKL International in Sweden, um, has been working particularly on the symbiosity approach, which we're very keen to learn about and to see how the synergies are with, with our own work. Has worked in Asia and Africa and has done her time in difficult places like Afghanistan. Um, and even Myanmar at the moment, which is increasingly becoming a difficult place again. Um, Piotr Lawrence, my good friend from um, the Dansk University of Technology, he's the head of the Department of Urban Design and Regional Planning. Also, uh, vice pres outgoing vice president, VP for another 24 hours, just like me, and Isokar, managing the Young Professionals Program but also the president of the Society of Polish Town Planners. And Piotr will be talking to us about the European approaches, you know, the Leipzig Charter, the European Urban Agenda. What are the values? What are the, what are the big essential elements within those that resonate with, with the guidelines or not? Um, and last but not the least, Qantas Westerberg, who also works with you in Habitat. Qantas is the odd one out on this table because he's not an architect, not a planner. Um, but he has a background in something very important that planners often lack, which is economics. 
and which is communications. Um, both, of, both of which are essential skills, but we often lack, I must say, and, and in international development. Pontus um, works with projects related to digital technology. So actually, he's our smart cities guy. We should all not even be here. He should be here representing you in Habitat in this conference. Uh, he works on public space. He works on community participation, and he he coordinates a, a very innovative program called Block by Block in your habitat, which works in Minecraft, you know, the video game Minecraft, and works with young people to actually uh, help design and redesign their own public spaces. So he will talk a little bit about how you translate these abstract global agendas through these slightly less abstract guidelines to actually projects on the ground. So. Um, I'd like to now give the floor to Andrea, who will um, take us through how the guidelines were developed, what they're about, what, what they contain, and we take it from there. Thanks. So um, thanks, Shipra, for that very comprehensive introduction. So now that we have the background of what we're dealing with worldwide, as planners, I'm going to take you a bit through the basics of the guidelines. Um, so what really are they? As Shipra said, the, this is a global reference framework and they were approved in 2015 by UN Habitat's member states. Uh, so the guidelines have been around for a couple of years now and they were developed in order to improve policies, plans, designs and implementation processes. So inside of them, inside this uh, little blue book we have here, you may find five universal goals, 12 principles, and 114 recommendations on how to get there. They are also available in 11 languages, which is um, a big part of its dissemination. And they are also UN Habitat's most popular tool slash publication, we could say, with over more than 100,000 downloads since their release. Um, so in essence, they are we could say a framework that works across multiple levels. It is multi-stakeholder. Uh, as you can see in the graphic, actually, they are addressed to four stakeholder groups, national governments, local authorities, planning professionals, and their associations, and members of civil society. So we always say that the guidelines are for everybody and that everybody should take part in their implementation. And because of this multi-level, multi-stakeholder, spirit, um, they enable um, working across sectors. Um, but there are many frameworks out there with this sort of principles in mind. So what's really new about this set of guidelines? Um, there are two key things about them, and it's that uh, they bring forth uh, two concepts to the planning table, let's say. So first uh, is the establishment of an integrated approach to planning because we're working across different levels, with multiple actors, with multiple sectors. And the second thing is their territorial approach. So, I mean, we're talking to planners in the room and all of those challenges Shipra mentioned at the beginning are, as you know, not usually constrained to an urban boundary. I mean, air quality doesn't stay within the city, it goes out all the way to the rural. So as planners, we are advocating for now um, to work across all of this spatial planning continuum, meaning all the way from urban to rural. And under the context of this Congress of smart communities, smart planning, well, we've heard today that smart can be many things. So it is often or popularly interpreted as the use of technologies to inform and support urban development. But under the spirit of the guidelines, smart refers to planning that is comprehensive, that is collective, that is inclusive, healthy, and well-informed, just to name a few characteristics. So on the one hand, they do try to take advantage of today's technological innovations. For example, um, at Habitat, we are producing a series of resources that are being developed as e-tools to, to get them out there to the public and to facilitate their use by the public, such as an, a mobile app, an online database, which I will talk about a bit later. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the guidelines are advocating for smart planning in the sense that they strive to achieve intelligent, well-informed decision-making and formulation of policies, of plans, of designs, 
taking into account those principles of sustainable development we've all set for each other, and placing people at the heart of planning. So that's the most important thing about the guidance, that people are at the heart, and basically that's who we are working for. So the guidelines are an opening to embrace both of these concepts and merge them into one common vision, creating a new type of planning practice that we're calling, aiming towards more integrated and territorial planning approaches. Um, so where are the guidelines now? So the guidelines so far, since their approval in 2015, have been in this sort of preparation mode where we've been working on collecting inspiring practices on planning, on developing learning tools, carrying out trainings, and setting up a monitoring framework. Uh, but more importantly, the guidelines are now moving towards application. So as I said, um, all of these tools are being released and trainings are being carried out in countries to sort of take those guidelines to implementation. So some of this list, I mean, uh, goes on, but this is some examples of the areas we're working on uh, and some of the countries in which we're working on as well. So the guidelines can be many things, but more importantly, I think it's time to start talking about uh, what can the guidelines do for us as planners and also what we can do for the guidelines. As I said before, the guidelines are for everybody. So I think, uh, yeah, it's time to start breaking down uh, what we can actually do with this sort of universal principles. So that said, uh, first, uh, let's start with the positive side of it. So there are several advantages and opportunities that can emerge from now having a sort of universal guidance on how to do planning. We could say that this is the added value of the guidelines. So first, they are drawing on more than 100 years of planning evidence. This is not one ad hoc document, but instead it's a condensed and evidence-based uh, collection from around the world. They are also what we are now calling a collective voice for planning. Um, not only do they provide with the common vision, as you can see, that is uh, very explicit, but now they bring a common language to the table in which planners can talk to civil society and also with governments. Then this universal character of the guidelines can fast track cross-border cooperation for planning, for doing development, for doing monitoring and evaluation as well. Um, and even more importantly, and, some, and something that as planners we must never forget, is that the guidelines consider that each context is different and that planning requires often pragmatism. So they do, need, they, they do consider the need to adapt this sort of general global principles to the local situation because in the end, uh, all the institutional arrangements, all the local culture, all the local leaders in place are what really influence what works on the ground. So localizing is, of course, very important. And they are also a continuous learning model. When you apply the guidelines, you learn by doing. Uh, and then these principles are moving from local to policy level and then back. So it's kind of like a continuous process. So that said, um, the guidelines are a systematic approach that enable us to look at different dimensions at the same time through this multi-level multi-stakeholder, multi-sector model, they provide for a channel um, for supporting an integrated implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and the New Urban Agenda. So with all of that, their proposal of subnational cooperation and goal achievement is actually something we can use to bring also those who are not exclusively related to urban development to the table. Um, and something really interesting, if you were at last year's ISOCAR, uh, where we had a training session on the guidelines, um, well, this is where everybody said they found the added value. You can see the biggest part is on the integration part. Um, but as I said, this is something we learn by doing. So when you apply the guidelines in your own context, you may find out, um, you may discover other areas in which the guidelines will have a significant contribution to your line of work and to doing integrated development. So now let's go a bit to the 
What happens if we don't use them? Let's say, what are we going to miss out? So if we continue business as usual, we will still encounter this challenge of the lack of coordination that you as planners must uh, face all the time. So we will continue with uh, lack of coordination and of course uh, the continued risk of polarization. So we really have to start talking to each other. Um, that means missing out on synergies as well and really not doing um, collaboration. And missing out on synergies might mean continued duplication, everybody working in parallel but not really talking to each other. And ultimately, this will just lead to the risk of not achieving our targets, that if we don't talk to each other, we might not get to those goals we so neatly set out for us. So what can you do for the guidelines? Um, there are many things uh, groups, institutions, and even individuals can do for the guidelines. Um, the first part uh, is that if you haven't heard about them, and now you did <laughs> in this session, you can raise awareness and advocate for them. So you saw that they are available in 11 languages because people have come out to translate them to their local languages, to host a session, and just spread the word, basically. Um, you, we have an ongoing collection of inspiring practices, as you saw earlier. So document and share those experiences and become part of that collection um, because sharing this knowledge and what people are doing and how they have overcome a challenge I think is the most uh, important part of this learning model. You can also support tool development. As I said, they are now moving towards a more um, intensive application at different scales and between different sectors. So you can test these tools, you can provide feedback to us and sort of in the end validate all of these tools your inhabitant is developing. In the part of planning education, um, we've had people come out to prepare a guidelines module, to consider them in the courses, or you can even carry out a guidelines training for planners, but also for non-planners, because remember, we are addressing multiple stakeholder groups here. You can also pilot the guidelines in your country, in your city, in your workplace. We are talking about and it's something that you will see later on. We're talking about public space or when you're doing planning for health, when you're working on urban rural linkages, that territorial component of the guidelines, uh, uh, pilot it. Um, then uh, we also have this monitoring framework and we actually every two years carry out this global survey on planning to see how people are doing. So take a part of the survey, it's uh, not difficult as planners you are the best people to say how planning is doing in your context. And also, I think this is the easiest part, just stay in touch. <laughs> we have started a mailing list that has now like 600 people, so tell us your story and we will send you updates on how the guidelines are doing. So as we are now saying, just be a champion. There are many, many options that as an individual, as a planner, as an institution, as a government, you can do. So take part of this work. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to loop back, use Andrea's balanced two minutes on her presentation, but just 30 seconds of those to loop back into the three challenges that I laid out. You know, the exploding small and medium cities with low capacity, the rural urban divergence, and the lack of vertical integration. This is where the whole urban and territorial planning approach, and this is where the guidelines that address multiple scales, sectors, and stakeholders actually come into play. And that is the, that is the kind of justification that we're building up to it. Okay, without further ado, uh, Helena, if you'd like to tell us about the symbiosity approach. Thank you, Shipra, and thank you, Andrea. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today it's, and be part of this very interesting discussion on how to localize the global agendas and the agreements that we have to actually lead the urban developments glo globally. Um, and you can also see a lot of um, linkages and synergies between the different approaches and between the different guidelines already. So. There will be a lot of words repeated, <laughs> as Andrea already mentioned. Uh, my name is Helena, and I'm representing SKL International, which the English um, 
translation is SALAR, the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions in Sweden. Uh, and SQL International is, uh, has a mission to support decentralization and local democracy and local governance on an international level. And we're working mainly with support from SIDA, the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. <coughs> and we are working on different projects uh, globally, Europe, Af Africa, Asia, and also in the Middle East. And since 2010, SQL International has taken the lead to actually work with the Symbiosity approach. Uh, the approach has been developed over a long period of years and it's actually origins uh, from a research, Swedish research project of how to work in a more sustainable way in Swedish municipalities. And those learnings over almost 20 years together with international experiences from different contexts has led to the development of this approach and the methodology. Um, and um, to be very just short, to try to explain short what Symbiosity is with just a, a word, <laughs> is that it, you can say that it's a framework and a tool to enable sustainable development. Uh, and I think, as I already mentioned, that we see a lot of synergies and a lot of complementarity with other guidelines and also approaches. So um, it's an approach which is also framing a process, I would say. Uh, so the aim of the approach is really to guide uh, and give tools to support um, sustainable development processes. And it's also based on the idea of turning opportunities. Instead of looking at problems, looking at opportunities and assets in different cities and turn that into possibilities. To see what we have and what we can actually do with it. And have a vision-based approach to development. So there are several ongoing university initiatives uh, from our side. So both international training programs, but also more hands-on development projects. So at the moment we are having simulated programs in Zambia, Colombia, Ethiopia, Tunisia, Myanmar and Kenya, uh, which supports uh, the local processes and the local implementations of the agendas. So for us, this is the approach. This is the focus of our approach. Cities are for people. It's the people that we should put in the center, in the heart, also as Andrea mentioned. And then we have been trying to elaborate and develop a, a tool to actually do that, to achieve that, and to work with a local context and local adaptation. So this also means that if we're going to plan and develop cities for people, we need also to involve the people that are the enables of development, and the people that actually constitute urban development, meaning different actors, meaning different stakeholders, meaning that we need to have a pro-poor perspective in our processes, we need to have a gender and equity perspective in everything we do and in the, the different, different processes that we are working in. Um, so in Symbio City approach, the local ownership is the key and the local context is the key. So it's not an approach with one solution, or one technical solution or guidance to how, we, how we're going to go forward. So it's actually to look at the local context and look at what are the existing structures and local solutions that we can enable through this methodology. And that means that we need to uh, draw out examples from best practices internationally to actually also guide this development and these processes. It also means that it's about strengthening existing structures and processes, and it's not about introducing new ones or parallel ones. It also means that we need to look at both informal and formal sector. It also means that political ownership and leadership is a key factor for this development and to move things into the right direction. Um, <clears throat> So for that reason, in our projects, we normally also work with the local government. Our partners are normally the cities in the different countries. And uh, 
what the SimbioCity approach actually aims to achieve and aims to support is to make change happen. So it's also to actually set up the steering committees, to set up the working groups that represent different actors and different um, silos in the different cities that we are working in. So it's actually through the processes that we are working in, through the different actual projects, we are also implementing the change and trying to see what are the ways forward uh, to reach the urban development that we want to reach. To get away from this and to start to work together in both vertical, vertical and horizontal level, meaning both, if you look into a municipal aspect, you're looking, working between the different departments of the municipalities, but it also means to enable and to ensure that we have the link between national level, local level, including also citizens. And this is the approach, the theoretical approach. <laughs> So what we actually are focusing on is the people in the center of development, looking at life quality, um, health, uh, livable cities, and then trying to break that out into the three different aspects of sustainability and localize those three aspects of sustainability. What does that mean in this context, in this city? <coughs> and this definition is then guiding us through the whole process, looking into urban systems, institutional factors, and special aspects. So this is the core model to actually work throughout our processes, to ensure that we are looking at the different aspects of urban development, from urban development to urban planning to urban management, and to also include all these three uh, core aspects uh, throughout our different work, tools, and methodologies. Uh, what's very significant for Symbio City is also the iterative process. So it's not a linear process. The aim is actually to look into these aspects of development, these solutions, in, uh, in a process that actually turns over and over again. So it's not a linear process, and it's not a static process. It means that everything that we do have to be reconsidered. If we are formulating a vision, we need to follow up that vision, and we need to make that happen. And we need also to evaluate the vision and the solutions that meets this vision. So, to simplify it a little bit, <laughs> these circles, this every loop is divided into six steps. Defining and organizing the process, diagnosis of current situation, objectives, working with scenarios and alternative proposals, analyze impacts, and also looking at the implementation and follow-up. And then what, what, this, what the tools are actually uh, consisting of are different methods and different tools that feed into all these different steps that will lead us and guide us in these kind of development processes. So for example, when it comes to participation and participatory tools, walkthrough evaluations, for example, we have also a backcasting model looking into how we can achieve the vision, going back to see what are the different steps that we need to take when it comes both to institutional and um, activities to actually re reach that vision. So it's, this is to just explain, explain the toolbox and what's actually the approach is containing in terms of tools. <clears throat> but it's not easy to explain this in this short time, so. <laughs> Uh, okay, so looking at how can the simplicity be useful then? Uh, how can we use the approach in different processes? So throughout the years that SKL has been working with this approach, uh, the types of uh, development projects has been different. So it's both looking into new developments, new uh, development of new sustainable areas. It's also renewing and upgrading of existing areas. It's improving new comprehensive and city-wide strategies and pl plans. Uh, it can also be to revise existing plan and also to support uh, the, the, the development into a more sustainable direction. But it has also been very much to support national policies and um, also to look into investment and financing. Uh, and the outputs of these processes 
Uh, these are some examples. So it's looking into urban sustainability reviews, that is a document reviewing uh, the existing situation, slightly like a diagnosis, you could say, uh, developing urban visions and strategies, of course, solutions and quick impact projects, transformative projects, uh, but also looking into urban management and maintenance. Just some examples from, from the field and how we have worked with this, with the um, eco-cycle models, uh, participatory events and processes, including uh, women, kids, uh, different parts of the society, uh, working with uh, sustainable lifestyles and behavioral changes, uh, urban gardening, for example. Um, uh, this I've already mentioned, but this, these are just some examples of what it, the output actually is from the, from the approach and what we can reach together. I just wanted to give you one a quote from one project that we worked on in, in China that also explains the outcome of using this methodology. So, uh, the, the, the final product that we were supposed to work on was highly discussed in the beginning. Uh, bicycle lanes were, was one option that was discussed in the beginning, but the, the discussion then led very much into that because of the topography, it won't be possible. And, and the obstacles of the everyday work was very much limiting uh, the process of developing the most sustainable uh, option for mobility in the city. <coughs> but Throughout this process, we were looking into existing, um, existing situation, the vision of the city, the objectives of the city, and what they actually wanted to achieve. Uh, and in the end, um, bicycle lanes, which was actually the final proposal, when we actually looked into different synergies of different kind of urban systems, when we looked into health aspects, when we looked into uh, equity aspects, the bicycle lanes actually was the product that was implemented. And today it's an integrated part of the, the city and this way of mobility in the city. Yeah. <laughs> so, going back to what we're going to talk about today, um, I just wanted to conclude to say that. Um, that we see a lot of linkages between the, the different um, agendas, between the different guidelines, between the different approaches. But from, from our experience and from our perspective, looking at the local <coughs> assets, looking at the local finances, and looking at the local possibilities is really the way forward to make change happen and to also include uh, all the different stakeholders uh, that are there and that are part of urban development already. They just need to be also part of the decision-making pro process. So, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, that's excellent. Um, I'd like to move straight on to Piotr. I didn't think you have a presentation. background picture to keep you attracted. I'm back in with that. But before we get to the nice background picture, uh, I'd like to draw your attention if you are coming back uh, to, so to speak, big politics on one hand, but the global issues on another, but with slightly different approach. And before we start, a quick question. Uh, who of you has seen the famous movie Pulp Fiction? Raise your hand. Okay, what is interesting about Europe? Does anybody remember? Quarter pounder with cheese, which means little differences, right? I mean, that's not for me. I, guess. <laughs> I just started. Okay. So, little differences. I'm going to speak about a slightly different approach to that, what uh, we are discussing today, which means uh, not about the quarter pounder with cheese, remember, please. <laughs> But, um, uh, and not about the metric system, which was another thing, but uh, I'm actually going to speak about a slightly different approach uh, towards shaping the uh, urban policy, and that how we are actually trying to do that in Europe, as this is still in the making, and this is a very interesting stage to talk about that. 
But before I go to that, I have to say that uh, we have over 27 years of discussion about that, what uh, actually sustainable urban development is going to be about. So this is uh, quite a long history. Um, we actually started that with 1990, with Green, Green Paper on Urban Environment, which has been introduced uh, uh, across EU. And since then, there was quite a few initiatives. And just to give you a couple of the landmarks about that, uh, 1994, Albert Char Charter on Sustainable Cities and Towns, the clay, then a uh, new Athens Charter, three editions of the whole document, which were edited by ICT, uh, we, at e by ECTP, which is European Council of Town Planners, 1998, 2003 and 2013. Then the famous Leipzig Charter uh, on Sustainable European Cities, uh, 2007. Then Toledo Declaration 2013 regarding development of urban areas and last but not least, the highlight of the whole process, European Urban Agenda 2016, which is right now under implementation. I mean, under implementation means under, um, under final shaping, so to speak. So we have quite, uh, so to speak, a long history about that. So there's one little difference. The second little difference about uh, our approach is that we actually are focusing not on uh, issues which we have been discussed before only, but also we look at planning and planners, which is interesting. Well, maybe because of the fact that some of these documents have been actually shaped about planners, and we planners love to talk about planners, mm -hmm. so this is why we are doing that. And actually since 2003, this new role for planners in this entire process has been widely discussed, and uh, within this new Athens Charter, an example, there are whole chapters associated with uh, what planners should do, how they should behave, how good should they be to all these issues, and, all, and so on and so on. And I don't want to be ironic by any means, of course, but that means that actually within Europe we do recognize that there are people who are actually supposed to deal with these things, and these people are planners. And third thing, which is also very important, is that we have quite uh, quickly moved from uh, just uh, recognizing issues and problems towards uh, shaping uh, some sort of uh, comprehensive approach. And I guess the former presentation from my colleague from Sweden was a perfect example of that, how this actually is being uh, discussed and implemented through some sort of comprehensive uh, planning exercises which lead towards uh, shaping the final vision for the whole thing. So, as I said, the whole thing has quite a long story, and I'm not going to go into the details of um, uh, all of those uh, things, which will pro pro probably this will take another couple of uh, alarms in the shipwrights phone, uh, but uh, at least, right? So I'm not going to bore you with that. But uh, I would like you to understand that this is a kind of very long process which is um, actually happening. And actually, the recognition of those needs uh, of, of, the, of development of the new urban development paradigms responding to the cultural and societal needs of the present and future generations has been on the agenda since uh, 1998. So that means that over 20 years ago, or almost 20 years ago, I mean, it, 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 it was already there. So it was already discussed and developed. So this is nothing new from that point of view. Uh, secondly, uh, the new vision for cities, how the cities should look like, has been discussed since 2003. So that means we started to look at that, what, how our cities in Europe should look like. Also understanding that the value of Europe is actually a very diversified and rich urban system, that we have not only big metropolitan areas, but small and medium-sized cities, and the presence and sustaining their development is one of the key issues regarding Europe. So this actually has been on the agenda since, as I said, 2003. And uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, we have started to discuss some sort of uh, uh, core values which should be taken into account when, di when discussing the future of, uh, of our urban agenda. And this actually has been started in 2007, starting with this famous Leipzig Charter for Sustainable European Cities. What is interesting is that this was developed by EU member states under the German presidency at that time. So that's why it was in Leipzig, in Germany, in Eastern Germany actually. So um, uh, the idea was to focus on uh, developing guidelines and getting them implemented. So it was not only about uh, uh, setting the general policy guidelines, but also to look at how these can be implemented. 
to promote integrated urban development, which at that time was uh, not so popular and to a large extent still, still is not popular. Uh, but that means we are not only talking about, uh, uh, about uh, space, but we are talking about all the other aspects, how, this, how space is shaped, functioning and, uh, and, uh, and working, and, and what are the other factors and stakeholders and all the other uh, people and institutions involved with that. But that also uh, was focusing on promoting sustainable spatial development of cities. So that means we also talk about planning, about physical planning, and how to employ physical planning in the process of shaping sustainable spatial development of cities based on decentralized urban system. This is very interesting thing again. Again, we are not talking about the metropolitan areas and some huge functional areas only, but we are looking at small and medium-sized cities, recogni re recognizing the value of those smaller communities in this entire process. Of course, this was coming from the understanding that Europe is slightly different to many of the other uh, continents uh, regarding our urban system. Uh, but I think this is an interesting approach which uh, also could be uh, discussed in other contexts. As, in too, as according to my personal uh, belief, we are talking too much frequently about only metropolitan areas and all the other things, like big scale. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, the, the small and medium-sized uh, communities are also, uh, uh, are, are, are also um, uh, uh, different, right? And uh, I hope I'm not mistaken if, I would, if I'm quoting another famous quote from one of the uh, US movies uh, uh, from the West Side Story this time, uh, which says everything is big in America, right? I mean, so in America, we all think big, right? I mean, big cities, big regions, big areas, I mean, big, fun big functional zones. When you travel from one end of the city to another, it takes hours, right? I mean, in the case of Europe, within hours, you can actually cross the whole country, right? I mean, and this is just another little difference in that case. So that's why um, this uh, uh, different approach on smaller communities, on those smaller uh, 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 villages and cities uh, re re recognized as entity, as entity on its own, is also a very important thing. And also taking into account that thinking about their sustainable development as such is an important issue. Uh, within Light Light Charter, we also had some two very uh, important recommendations uh, embedded in this in this document. The first one. Uh, it was to use to a larger extent this integrated approach to urban development, which uh, we already discussed. But also there was another thing, which was focusing on crisis areas in context of the city as unity. But crisis areas, it not only mean uh, uh, areas in social crisis, but also brownfield redevelopment. It also means uh, uh, areas which need uh, economic empowerment, areas which need to be uh, redeveloped. Mm -hmm. But what is very interesting, not only to think about the sites themselves, but within the context of the entire of the entire uh, cities. Uh, this was firmly developed within the Toledo de 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 Declaration regarding development of urban areas, which I'm not going to talk about because uh, she is will be looking at her phone. Uh, so I'd like to focus on the on the final part of that, which is European Urban Agenda, developed in 2016. Uh, which is the Pact of Amsterdam. This is uh, the newest development in the whole row of the whole of, uh, of this European urban policy. And uh, this Pact of Amsterdam is uh, it's not, it's not, it's not such a big document. You can read it in, uh, I guess, in every language which is uh, represented in this, in this room here. Um, uh, but actually, it's based, uh, it's the idea of the Pact of Amsterdam is to get focused on three political pillars, on providing better regulation, better funding and better knowledge creation and dissemination. So that means EU has understood that uh, in order to make cities sustainable and in order to make cities compact and in order to do all those things which we uh, talked about so far within the last 20 years, we have to first of all get better regulation <coughs> regarding that and in many cases this regulation is uh, implementing some pan-European approaches towards uh, towards uh, urban development and planning. The second thing is we need to get better funding and financial instruments regarding uh, stimulating the development of that. Again, Europe has a lot of experience with funding urban projects, but apparently they are not uh, good enough or they have been finished, like uh, 
in, a, in example the urban initiative which had a couple of the of the projects implemented uh, in uh, in Europe and then we need better knowledge we need uh, gathering knowledge we need dissemination knowledge and all these kind of the things which is there I mean Europe has many uh, 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 organizations, your, your universities, we are creating this kind of knowledge, but definitely it is not disseminated good enough in order to, to make the whole thing. And the focus in this case is a focus on integrated approach towards sustainable urban development. And again, there are 12 priority areas uh, which, uh, within which the whole thing is supposed to be implemented. And this is a very interesting thing, you know, because uh, it was not only about talking about those three pillars, three political pillars, but also the idea was to translate those three political pillars into real, uh, into real uh, uh, priority areas and to see how these can be developed. And what is interesting is not only the choice of those priority areas, but also the way of how to work on them. And the idea was to work on them not just by, by some tools of experts, but through so-called partnerships. So within Europe, we are right now have 12 working partnerships, which are being, each of them is being coordinated by the different uh, entity. It can be either the municipality or a member state, uh, with participation of uh, non-governmental organizations, universities, and other entities which uh, can help in developing of that. And one of them is actually sustainable land use and nature-based solution, just one of 12. And uh, the other ones are associated with inclusion of migrants and refugees, air quality, <laughs> urban poverty, housing, circular economy, jobs and qualifications, climate change, transforming energy systems, urban mobility, digital, uh, digital cities, and uh, innovative and uh, responsive public uh, procurement, which is interesting about regulation, funding, and all the other things associated with that. On top of it, there is also a whole set of horizontal issues identified like an example, effective urban government, cross-border, cross-administrative uh, uh, management, reasonable and strategic city planning, and so on. There's quite many of those um, items. And as I said, uh, what is interesting is that those 12 priorities are being implemented by 12 partnerships, which are working right now. So if any of you are from any EU member state, or if you want, or if you are in an NGO which has a chance to become um, uh, a part of the process, uh, please watch carefully because uh, this could be very interesting what those uh, uh, partnerships are going to come out with. And they are not going to come out with uh, topics which have to be dealt with, but they also are supposed to produce in the end an action plan. So in the end of the whole process, like mid next year or end next year, which, which means end 2018, we might actually have a set of 12 action plans regarding each of those. And also, they will be coordinated uh, between them themselves via uh, by European Union and so on. Right, okay, so ship, ship reform is uh, in the analog version is uh, working. So just uh, to add on that, I can say that uh, uh, this whole process is being happening right now. And it's very interesting to watch what will be the results and how this will be implemented. I mean, again, what is interesting about Europe is this little difference to US, which means that we have uh, a number of the member states and each of them has a slightly different approach towards implementing the results of the whole thing. But even if this is not implemented uh, Europe-wide, uh, still uh, the results which we get might be of extraordinary importance and might uh, extensively contribute to the debate in that how our urban agenda should look like, and I think that they might be also taken into account by human habitat when actually thinking about implementing uh, the, new urban, the new urban agenda. And last but not least, I can say that uh, many of those things are already being uh, implemented locally by different uh, uh, nations or institutions or NGOs. I just want to say about the society which I'm representing, which is the Society of Polish Town Planners. So for more than 12 years actually we are developing a nationwide contest for the best public space which at the beginning was met in sort of so okay oh so I'm almost done uh, and uh, and this contest actually has produced a number of the of the good examples of that how this problem should be solved so it's just like little thing in this big ocean of problems but this is actually 
a part of the game which is uh, uh, very important to be uh, discussed, implemented, and actually uh, when you are talking about all those things, through projects like this you actually go to the reality, to the thoughts and, inspira and aspirations of the local com com communities. So I think this is uh, a good thing to finish with. Thank you very much. It's the perfect segue to our last presentation, which is by Pontus on uh, projects on the ground, you know, which are helping to implement the international guidelines and, and several of the other approaches being piloted in your inhabitant. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, as Shipra said, I'm, uh, I'm not a planner. Uh, I'm an economist, but also digital technology specialist. But I've been working for more than five years at UN Habitat and worked with a lot of planners from local authorities uh, all over the world. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm going to talk about UN Habitat's public space work and <laughs> how we use community participation uh, in, in that work. Um, and when we're looking at the, the main principles of the, of the planning guidelines, uh, participatory decision making and participatory approaches is, is key to them. Um, and very simplified, this is kind of how UN Habitat uh, sees urban development. We go from urban sprawl to compact cities, segrega segregation to integration, uh, congested cities to <coughs> connected cities. Uh, and public space is, is key to that. Uh, UN Habitat's global public space program has been active since about 2011-2012. Uh, it's got three main uh, aims uh, to create a big global network on, with partners working on public space, physical construction and upgrading of public spaces in collaboration with local authorities, and knowledge sharing, advocacy and, and communications. And when it comes to the network, we have lots and lots of partners. We work with local authorities, we work with the private sector, we work with NGOs, we work with other UN agencies, and some of our partners are right here on the, on the screen. Um, we also have ongoing projects in about 25 countries. There are about 45, 50 projects uh, on every continent, but with a main focus on Africa and, and Asia. Uh, and I guess I don't really have to talk about the importance of public space to a room full of planners, but it really impacts on health and well-being, on environment, on integration, uh, social issues, uh, and so on. And of course, in terms of the, of the guidelines, without adequate public space, you can't have compact and done cities. Um, from our perspective, public space is basically everything that is not private space in the city. So on top of traditional public spaces like squares and parks and so on, we also consider the street network, pavements, the way that people move around the city as important. And we have a, a kind of target, which is that well-planned cities should have about 50% of the surface areas public space. And when I say 50%, that's about 35% streets and pavement and 15% other public spaces like squares and parks and playgrounds and, and so on. Of course, most cities are not like that. Here's an example from Northern California, one of those commuter towns uh, outside San Francisco. Uh, Cul-de-sacs, no pavements. Most people are driving to work somewhere in the, in the Bay Area and driving back. Not so much interaction with the neighbors. They're spending a lot of time in their cars. Here's another example from Nairobi, where I live. On one side, you've got the slum. On the other side, you've got the gated community lack of, of integration. Another example from Sao Paulo. You've got the highway separating the informal settlement from the high-rise, more upper-class neighborhood. On one side, you probably have a lot of community, but almost no public space. On the other side, you have more public space, but perhaps no community. So for us, the city is for people. This is perhaps the, the traditional planning uh, process from the last century, where you start with buildings, traffic, and then think about the life. We want to, of course, turn it around and start with the life 
then think about space, and then think about the, the buildings. So I'm going to talk about two things that we're doing to, to ensure that we bring the life into public space planning. One of them is a methodology for community-led citywide public space assessments that we uh, have started doing in, in African cities. We've done it in Nairobi, in Kenya, in Bamenda, Cameroon, and Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And uh, we're st soon going to launch it also in Johannesburg, South Africa, and Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. There's a lot of interest from our local government partners to, to work with us on this. And essentially what it is, is a community process. We train uh, citizens, often students, uh, in, a, um, in a data collection application. We use a set of open source call, uh, tools called Kobo Toolbox. And uh, basically that allows us to go out into the city, uh, use a mobile app, to both uh, collect qualitative data about the, the quality, the status of public spaces, as well as spatial, spatial and quantitative data to be able to map out where the public spaces are in the, in the cities. And this then helps our local authority partners to develop uh, citywide public space strategies. Uh, this is what we end up with. This is for Addis Ababa. Uh, so we end up with lots of information on all the public spaces in relation to things like safety and security, comfort, uh, access to other services, street networks, and, and so on. And in many other parts of the world where we work, this data just doesn't exist. Uh, here's an example, for example, from Nairobi, uh, which is quite interesting. It's safety perce perception in, in public space. Uh, I guess not uh, surprisingly, most public spaces are much safer in the day than in the night. But essentially what we do is we go out and ask people in those public spaces about their uh, perception of, of safety. Uh, and using this methodology then, we were able to uh, work out that Nairobi has 7.43 square meters of, of green space. The World Health Organization recommendation is that cities should have 9 square meters per capita per, per person. And this then enables Nairobi to start planning how it can increase the uh, amount of green space that is in the city. <coughs> the other thing that I want to talk about is uh, an approach where we use Minecraft, the video game, for community participation. It actually starts right here. This is a typical public meeting for, I think it's for the, uh, the city plan of, of Houston in the, in the US. And if you look at the picture, the people that come to these meetings tend to be uh, older. Old. <laughs> Here's another meeting uh, in a different part of the world. It's my colleague Rasmus who is meeting community leaders from an informal settlement in, in Haiti. Can you see any young people here? There is actually a, a little boy that's standing in the corner here, behind, I presume it's his, his dad. But from the picture you can see that it's very unlikely that this little boy will have the, the confidence to, to actually speak out in this kind of setting. Any women? There are actually two women in this, in this picture. And I, I think you can see pretty clearly from their positions that they're also very unlikely to be able to, to have their opinion heard in this, in this kind of setting. So that was the kind of starting point. How can we get young people as, a, as the first thing, but also other hard to reach groups involved in community participation processes? And actually thinking about how, thinking about youth is uh, not a kind of uh, minor concern. This is the population pyramid for Kenya, where I live. And as you can see, way more than half the population are under the age of 30. So this is really, really important. And it looks like this in most countries of the, of the global south. So we use Minecraft. Who here has played Minecraft? All right, a few. Who has kids that have played it? All right, a few more. It's basically one of the world's most popular video games. Uh, I think the latest figures are something like 140 million people have bought it. They have every month about 40 million people logging in to play. 
Uh, in September, so last month, it was the third most played video game in the US. And that is after it's been out for about seven years. It's huge. Huge, huge, huge community. Um, essentially what it is, I would say, is like digital Lego. You have um, digital blocks that you can place in uh, basically an endless world. And when you start thinking about it, it becomes much more than a game. Uh, it's more like a basic three-dimensional architectural sketching tool. And here are some examples of stuff that the Minecraft community, who get together on servers all over the world, have, have built in, in terms of that kind of architecture. The first one, you've got a server called the Manhattan Project, which is a recreation of 1930s New York. Second one, I think you recognize the Eiffel Tower. So some people have basically got together to build all of Paris in Minecraft. The third one is Eindhoven Central Station. And number four, anyone, anyone watch um, Game of Thrones? It's uh, King's Landing. It's a server called Westeroscraft, where they basically built all of the Game of Thrones world in, in Minecraft. It's a fantastic community. And it's a fantastic, fantastic tool. Uh, and what we've done since 2012 is that we have a collaboration with a company that makes Minecraft, Mojang. They were actually bought two years ago by, by Microsoft. And we call this Block by Block. And actually in the last year and a half, we've started a, together with them a foundation called the Block by Block Foundation, which does fundraising with the Minecraft community for public space implementation work. How does it work? So, as I said, we've, we've done about 45 projects in 25 countries, so I'm going to illustrate this with different examples from different parts of the world. First, we take uh, plans and drawings and information about the public space that we are going to upgrade. This is an example from a square in Mexico City called Plaza Lex Cuaque. Uh, we then give that to a group of Minecrafters. So we've hired Minecraft players all over the world to work with us. Uh, they then build a three-dimensional Minecraft model of, of the space. So here you can see at the top you've got the original picture and then at the bottom you've got the Minecraft model. It's a bit blocky, the, it's not exactly correct, but you can immediately recognize the space in there. And We find wherever we work that people go into this three-dimensional world and they recognize their environment immediately and can start working. Then we run workshops. They're typically two to five days. They start with a site visit. We go out and look at the, at the site that, we're, that is under discussion. Uh, we go into a room and we have a kind of community meeting. We discuss the pros and cons, what are the challenges with this particular space. Perhaps write it down, so on. This is in Ethiopia. And then we provide training in how to build uh, in, in Minecraft. And it's super, super easy. You basically walk around with the arrow keys on your keyboard. With a mouse, one click places a block, the other one breaks it. Um, kids in the Middle East start playing after about five minutes, they start building. Uh, when we're working with, with, with people in informal settlements in Africa that perhaps have never used computers before, it takes two to three hours. But certainly the second day of every workshop, everyone is building away and are able to start basically um, coming up with, with three-dimensional sketches for how to improve that, that public space. This guy here in the middle, who's being helped by these young, uh, young boys, is a uh, matata driver, a bus driver from, uh, from Kenya. He'd never used computers before, but you can see the concentration. And the really interesting thing also, mixing different ages in this way, is that you get the young people teaching the older people how to do it, and you, have to end, up, you end up with this kind of intergenerational communication. Here's another example from a project that we did in, in Hanoi, Vietnam, with about 50 teenage girls. This is from, uh, from East Jerusalem, Palestine, also working with, with teenagers. And this is what you kind of end up with. So this is a park design uh, that a group of people did in, in Lima, Peru. Safe crossing from, from Kosovo. Ping pong table from Nepal. Cafe facilities, also from, from Kosovo. And then at the end, we invite 
stakeholders, usually representatives from the local government, planners, sometimes we get the mayor to come down, and then the participants present their work and their ideas to that group of, of stakeholders. And then we use a fairly simple table where we write down all the different ideas and we're able to prioritize them and come to a consensus on, on all the different services and, and ideas that should be included in the kind of final design. We use this table. Uh, and then we take that stuff and we give it to a professional architect or urban designer who translates it into real actionable uh, designs, technical drawings that we can use to, uh, to actually implement the public spaces. And then we build them. This is, yeah, this one is Kosovo in Pristina. It's, you've seen it? Yeah. Excellent. It's, it should be ready in about one month, I think. This one is from, from Lebanon in, in Beirut. So, uh, just to finish, to say that uh, the Block by Block Foundation has a website, which is blockbyblock.org. You can go and check out uh, the work there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, you can, as you can see, there are um, plenty of common, common threads, common themes emerging. I won't go into them straight away, but we have some time for discussion. Questions, answers, I already see one hand there. One more. We'll take a few at a time, three. Okay, let's take these three. Arun, just introduce yourself, please, and then. Um, Arun Jan, I'm an urban designer and urban practice, and I've done a lot of work around the world, but I've also been working in the super urban environment in the last time. Um, I have one comment and actually two questions, but um, the comment I would simply make is that, you know, um, in, in serious long range planning, No, just place it and then we'll we'll take it forward and then I'll collect a few questions. Thank you. Jens?
We'll be happy to take that question on the global dimensions and then Piyavi can respond to those. The last uh, of this round, at least. I guess it just struck me in the last uh, presentation by uh, Block by Block Foundation, what, what have you seen in the realm of um, disaster risk reduction, both pre and post disaster, as far as using those tools for mitigation and, and building properly and not building in certain areas? Very good. Let's start with those three, and then we'll take another round. Um, Pontus, you want to go first? You have a number of questions, uh, observations addressed to you, and then Piotr, and then any general uh, feedback. So I think on the, on the first question, uh, I guess I'm not a planner, but I, <laughs> I think this, the, the block by block approach in Minecraft is, is one way to get communities to co-create and, and do urban design. It's a way to to find it's, 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 a, it's a way to encourage communication between ordinary people and, and professionals around those those kind of things. I think it absolutely needs to be part of a, of a broader process, uh, and it's it's just one tool, uh, and we like to see it being being uh, complemented by by other things. On the on the issue of uh, risk reduction, post disaster, and so on. We have done some projects in those kind of in those kind of settings. We had a recent uh, project where we were rebuilding public spaces in Bungamati in Nepal. It's uh, just outside Kathmandu. Um, happy to, to share some experiences uh, from that particular project afterwards if you're, if you're interested. Well, uh, thank you very much, Aaron, for these comments. Uh, obviously, you are very well informed about what was happening in Poland. But uh, uh, I'd like to start the, with the response to your general, general comment, which means uh, the adaptation to the new realities. I think we are living in a world which is constantly changing, and the speed of this change is increasing. You know, so uh, we might actually have a situation that we are not even anymore living in the like seven or ten years economic cycles, but we are living in a cycles which lasts for one month sometimes. You know, so uh, like one month from now, we are living in a different realities that we were living before. So, uh, I mean, the only response to that is that we have basically to reinvent planning regarding that. And uh, the tools and, and, uh, and ways we do, we do planning cannot be static anymore. I mean, they have to be very adaptive to those new realities. So, again, you know, the, the, very, the very valid is Eisenhower's famous quote, which means plants are nothing but planning is everything. And this is basically what the whole thing mm -hmm. is about in this case, right? Regarding the future of regional planning in Poland, well, you're very right about that, that actually in the entire Central and Eastern European bloc, the regional planning has been like completely forgotten because it was uh, perceived as a tool of oppression from the communist system. Uh, so we have decided to focus on the local development. And uh, in case of, uh, 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 you know, I mean, in Poland, we actually do have the situation that uh, uh, right now uh, we started to realize that uh, uh, the, the reality we have produced uh, through that is not what we wanted, so to speak, right? And this is kind of uh, general perception that this is not what we wanted. 
And uh, we're also looking at this European examples of uh, approaches to the, to the comprehensive planning in order to overcome the shortcomings of this, of this approach which we used to have before. But also to overcome this uh, lack, of, uh, of lack of regional planning, but not through reinstalling the regional planning as it was or as it was supposed to be, but through actually looking at the functional areas, metropolitan areas, mm -hmm. and all these kind of the areas which basically are, uh, are identified through some presence of the common problems or, or common features. And through that, we are able to uh, actually plan for both. And there is an ongoing debate right now, an ongoing reform, actually, of the planning system in Poland. Nobody yet knows what will be the final shape of that because that was being proposed. It's extremely complicated, and this is probably not the idea of reforming anything to make things complicated. <laughs> but, well, uh, some, sometimes we have cases like that. And uh, finally, you know, I mean, in case of Poland, we have uh, a lot of non planned ur urbanization, and this is uh, something which is actually not entirely true because, I mean, we have a lot of sprawl which, we, which, which was actually planned for, right? I mean, so we, we planned for that and we got what, what we wanted, but we don't like what we got. So this is <laughs> the case. And, uh, uh, and there is another famous quote saying that you like things designed by Italians and made with the German precision, but not the vice versa. Unfortunately, we got cities without any Italian style and without any German precision. So this is the problem which we have over there. Uh, that's why we are looking at these European examples and uh, lessons also, uh, just in order to fix the whole problem. Okay, thanks very much. Um, just on that regional planning question though, Arun, I think that's a general trend that we've thrown out regional planning, even in India and in other parts, we've actually thrown out regional planning and now we're rediscovering it through this whole territorial approach, um, you know, on sort of work, working at different scales in different territories and combining rural and urban. And it's really trying to do regional planning without the challenges and the problems of regional planning. So I think we're, we're revisiting that. I want to go to Helena, I think, um, uh, also to address Jens's question, which which I we at Habitat will also, I think, take, but also looking at, can guidelines like these address the larger capacity building challenge of you know having national urban policies and a balanced national approach, and can the symbiosity approach, for example, um, assist with that in some ways? Um, yeah, I think I would like to connect that to actually the first question, mm -hmm. because it's very much about the long-lasting impact and the sustainability of what all of us are actually doing. And I mean, what we are facing a lot in our project is also the lack of capacity, the political interests, and a lot of uh, local complexities that also make the implementation of the agendas very, very difficult and challenging. So, um, I mean, to look at the institutionalization of the processes, and, and also, as I mentioned before, that to uh, involve different kind of stakeholders and actually to set up uh, permanent systems and structures that can continue over a longer period of time. So not only groups working into specific projects, but also to institutionalize uh, new stakeholder uh, groups and, and committees that can work together also in a long -term, longer term perspective. Uh, in addition to that, to also find working measure, me methods <laughs> um, that can actually uh, reinforce the work that uh, is being done uh, through the local governments and also through municipalities uh, on everyday basis. Mm -hmm. So it's actually to also find everyday tools and, um, and uh, methodologies to work on everyday basis. Also to recognize leadership on, on all levels, I would say. Uh, so it's not also always about political leadership, but also leadership on, on more local level. Um, also have the perspective of uh, training of trainers and learning by doing. So it's actually supporting already ongoing processes and to support uh, where the challenges actually arise and to then see how you can implement the, the different recommendations of the agenda. Very good, thank you. Andrea, some comments on uh, national level policies or the implementation guidelines at different levels? So, yeah, um, I will speak from the perspective of the guidelines. Um, adding to this comment is that um, 
sometimes even though uh, we work at the local level. Uh, so far we've been lacking that sort of backbone, that sort of structure to sort of translate all of these actions, as we say, into the bigger picture. So, but lately we've been had so much momentum, so this SDG 11, this new urban agenda, and now the guidelines, that sort of like now there's kind of like no excuses. And the idea of the guidelines is, as if you remember from the presentation, that you're supposed to work on all of these policies, plans, designs, the strategies, and the processes themselves in order to ensure that when you're working at the local level, this goes up, or when you're working at the policy level, then you start going down. Mm -hmm. So that's the spirit of the guidelines. Um, and it's something that at Habitat, we sort of say, sometimes you, you have to have an entry point. I know it sounds so difficult to say, how can I work at the national level, then the regional, then the municipal, then the neighborhood, but just look for that entry point. Um, and now, as I said, we have this backbone to anchor all of these actions on and then work across all the levels. So. Very good, thank you. Um, any further questions, thoughts from the floor? To the last two minutes. We're, over, we're actually over time, so it's not even two minutes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not going to try and summarize, but very quickly to just um, pick out a few phrases that came in all the presentations and in the, some of the comments that you offered. Number one, trying to put people at the center. I think that was, a, that was something that came out of all the, all the presentations. The second one was that leadership is key, and Andrea just reinforced that, political leadership, but also community leadership, civic leadership, civil society leadership, you know, and finding that leadership, really, in the champions is key. The third, in terms of integration, uh, jurisdictional coordination, you called it, but her horizontal integration, vertical integration, both. And again, finding the entry point, come through the bottom, come through the middle, come through the top, but just make sure that, that you know, then you, um, you make sure there's integration. I think there's, um, there was a very um, strong reinforcement of the idea that we're also pushing that you know, there's, there's need for um, supporting a diversified and a rich urban system. And I think the national urban policies work of your inhabitant actually supports that very much. We have national urban policy work going on in over, I don't know, not from your inhabitant alone, but in about 100, and 100 odd countries at the moment are undertaking national urban policies or sub national urban policies, depending on where the urban sits. And really, that is about creating that diversified and rich urban system, including paying enough attention and recognizing the value of smaller communities which is what Piotr was also saying. By the way, the Leipzig Charter was one of the resource documents for, this, for these guidelines, and it was reviewed in, in great detail. I think there's another bit that we talked about, which is on, you know, when you talked about the integrated approach and the crisis areas in the Leipzig Charter, we are now talking about urban regeneration, infill, plant city extensions, which is some of the key words that UN Habitat uses in, in its work. It's really about that. It's about addressing the areas which need attention first. It's about planning your brownfield sites first. It's about doing plan city extension, and then thinking about some random new town, you know, sort of development in, in a greenfield setting. I think the last thing I'd like to say is that all of this tells us a little bit about planning by itself is not enough. The dimensions, what, what you and Habitat promotes as the three-legged approach, legislation, planning, and finance. All three need to go hand in hand. Planners by themselves cannot do it. Legislation by itself is ineffective. And financing without making sure it gets directed to the right priorities also doesn't work. So for any, um, any of these approaches to succeed, those are really the three dimensions you need, to, you need to think about. I'm going to leave it there. Any tweets? Last final statements? Nothing? 140 characters? You already said yours. Plans are nothing. Planning is everything. I like that. OK. Anything else? Last thoughts? No. OK. Thank you very much, and thank you for staying.